things happen from time to time, of course, in the job. Sometimes women might see you and um, find you attractive. Reduce the predators yes. who take advantage of their economic um, mm -hmm. realities, especially our poverty. Yeah. It, it would, could never have been considered a serious relationship. In 2007, the Jamaican murder rate surged over 17% from its 2006 level. The government struggled to contain the crime levels as criminal gangs fought bloody battles for control of extortion rackets, gun smuggling schemes and more. When the smoke cleared, a total of 1,574 people were murdered in Jamaica in 2007. Believe it or not, 19 of them were members of the Jamaica police force. Most people have never even heard the name Gilbert Kameka. He was a high-ranking Jamaican police officer, an assistant commissioner of police to be exact, who was killed under questionable circumstances on November 29, 2007. Gilbert Kameka's body was discovered in the bedroom of a small home in a sleepy community known as Irish Town. He had been shot twice and the strange home in which he was found was nowhere near his actual home. As it turns out, the facts of the case were even stranger than fiction. For some, it was a story of a police officer who lost his life to unscrupulous criminal elements. To others, it was a textbook case of what happens when you find yourself in unfamiliar territory. Gilbert Kameka was born on July 26, 1959, and ended up joining the Jamaica Constabulary Force when he turned 20 years old. After leaving police training school, he was posted in the parish of St. Elizabeth in southern Jamaica. It took him 12 years to move from constable to inspector, which was remarkably quick. At the height of his career, he was the person responsible for all police in the parishes of St. Mary, St. Anne and Portland, almost a quarter of the island of Jamaica. That's a huge responsibility, and should give you an idea of the kind of officer he was. He was in charge of making decisions and not necessarily out on the street doing enforcement. Here is a former Jamaican police officer talking about his experiences and his memory of Gilbert Kameka. Well, as everybody know that um, Kameka was a red-skinned man, as was an acting white man in the organization. The man was quite famous for riding him in bike to meetings and all manner of things. I remember when I saw him the first time at the academy, riding up the hillside on his bike helmet and everything. Now at this level, there are many benefits to the job. The first is that you'd probably have a high status as a result of your position. In Jamaica, there's no shortage of people who look up to a person like this. You're probably the kind of person many people want as their friend. In addition, if you are male, you'll probably get a fair amount of female attention. Jamaican women are known to love a man in uniform, and it's a bonus when the uniform is the brown khaki of a high-ranking police officer. Now, for the record, as far as we know, Gilbert Kameka was a married man, a happily married man. The next main benefit of being an officer at his level is that you'd probably have plenty of freedom. As long as the work gets done, no one is going to notice if you go missing for a couple hours. Irish Town is located in the hills of a parish called St. Andrew. It sits just outside the hustle of the city below. Irish Town is not known as a dangerous area. Mr. Kameka would have had no reason to be uneasy about visiting Irish Town on the day he was killed. Here's a clip of a Jamaican YouTuber confirming what we know about Irish Town. Hidden gems that has several places that you can visit, specifically Irish Town. Now, Irish Town is somewhere that people don't really speak about in terms of the tourism industry, but I can tell you, Irish Town is just a fabulous location. It has great views. The people there are friendly. On November 29, 2007, Gilbert Kameka was talking with a junior police officer on the phone. He mentioned to the junior officer that he was in Irish Town. During the phone conversation, the officer on the other end of the line with Mr. Kameka heard what sounded like frantic shuffling as well as men speaking aggressively. He couldn't tell how many people were there, but it sounded like there were at least two men. Helplessly, he listened in as what sounded like gunshots were fired. 
He heard at least two shots. Then the line went dead. He called back and the phone rang out and went to voicemail. He was worried and started calling other officers to see if they knew where Mr. Kameka was last seen. They wouldn't have to wait long to find out more. Half an hour later, a young woman randomly walks into a Kingston police station and gets straight to the point. She is here to report a robbery and murder. The woman's name was Tina Gay McGowan. She is 18 years old. She is with a man named Rohan Townsend. They were both interviewed by police. Her story was simple. She claims to have been staying at the house of a friend in Irish town when a male companion came over to see her. During their time together, they were ambushed by three men who shot him, and she came straight to the police station. When asked to describe her friend, she described him as an older man who was a government worker. Police were suspicious of this entire story, obviously. It was especially suspicious because she said that her friend who was shot was perhaps in his 40s or 50s. She, after all, was only 18. None of this made sense. When police were eventually dispatched to the Irish town location, they discovered the body of the assistant commissioner of police, dead, with his weapon missing. He was partly undressed, as if he were making himself comfortable in the home. The dead man was not a humble civil servant after all. Instead, he was a high-ranking police officer. He had been shot twice, and the only eyewitness was an 18-year-old girl who couldn't fully explain how she knew him or why they had met up in Irish town in the first place. By the death of the assistant commissioner of police, it's always particularly disturbing when a police officer is killed. It's even worse when it happens under circumstances that lead to more questions than answers. Every police officer feels that when a police officer is murdered, more so one of the higher ranking officers. So the temperature was the temperature was um, just flaming hot with, 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 with anger. And of course, a lot of sadness, disbelief, especially since persons had spoken to him shortly before or even interacted with him that day. Jamaican police worked overtime to move the murder investigation forward. So far, they knew that Mr. Kameka had been shot. They even had an eyewitness. However, they could not link Tina directly to the crime just yet. Predictably, Tina Gay eventually broke down after multiple rounds of intense interrogation. The tragic story she told was hard to listen to and even harder to believe. Here is what police found out. In September of 2007, about two months before he was murdered, Gilbert Kamika met Tina Gay McGowan. At the time, she was about 18 years old, about 30 years younger than he was. It didn't take long for their relationship to grow. By November 2007, they had become romantically involved with each other. Well, sex is sex, no matter how you look at it. I don't very much do a serious relationship. So I wouldn't call it such. I don't think it was a serious relationship as an established family man. Things happen from time to time, of course, in the job. Sometimes women might see you and um, find you attractive. Maybe skin color, who knows? But all these factors in play, it's hard to say what the attraction was. But most men yearn for younger women sometime later on in life. Not all men, but I'm just saying that it, it would, could never have been considered a serious relationship. Not with the man's um, familial background as well as his, um, his position in the JCF. Two days before Gilbert Kameka was murdered, Tina visited an area of Kingston popularly known as Ravinia. She confessed that she was there to comb and groom the hair of her ex-boyfriend. His name was Masinisa Adams. They used to be romantically involved, but now maintained just a platonic casual friendship. She confessed that they communicated regularly. That day, while she was grooming his hair, the conversation drifted to the topic of love and relationships. Mr. Adams asked her if she was still seeing the same man who she had met in September, Mr. Kamika. She confirmed that they were still together. You see, about a month before she had told her ex-boyfriend that her new love interest was a sharp businessman who always carried a gun. While she was doing his hair, she also mentioned that her new lover would be visiting her soon so they could spend some quality time together. It's not clear if she realized it, 
but he was latching on to these details of the conversation, making connections between all the information she shared with him. Investigators still aren't sure if she realized it, but Tina's ex-boyfriend had already started to form a deathly plan in his mind. Specifically, he had decided he would somehow find a way to disarm Tina's new boyfriend and take his gun for himself. A firearm of one's own is greatly prized in the Jamaican criminal underworld. Interestingly, while she was in Ravinia, she also met another man who hung around. She did not know him, but she would see him again sooner than she realized. The next day, over the phone, her ex-boyfriend told her his plan, plain and straight. He wanted her new boyfriend's gun for himself. He planned to come take it by force the next time they met up. Tina did not object to this. In fact, she agreed and immediately became an accomplice. On the day he was murdered, just before 11 a.m., Gilbert Kameka drove to Irishtown to meet Tina. It was supposed to be a routine visit. He parked his vehicle near a wholesale shop in the community and met up with Tina. Once they got to the house, Tina's ex-boyfriend called her cell phone. She took the call discreetly to hide it from Mr. Kameka. On the phone, he asked simple, cold questions. Is your new boyfriend at the house yet? Does he have the gun there with him? Tina quietly confirmed that Gilbert was present and he had his gun with him. From here, things moved very fast. Tina had to come up with a plan to leave the house so that Mr. Kamika would not suspect he was about to be robbed. She told him that she had to walk a female friend to a nearby bus stop and would return to him after. The evidence suggests that she did go to the bus stop. However, on the way back to the house, Tina met up with her ex-boyfriend Masinissa, along with the man she had seen him with, the day she did his hair in Ravinia. They were both armed with guns and seemed to be full of a nervous, uncomfortable energy. Sadly, Gilbert was waiting back at the house, expecting a female companion, not a party of three. When they got to the house, Tina was the first to enter. She walked seductively into the room where Mr. Kamika was, as if to hide the fact that he was being set up. Right behind her, the two men had covered their faces with handkerchiefs. They burst into the room and pounced on Gilbert in a surprise attack. He was on a phone call with a junior officer when they came in. There was no warning. This wasn't going to be a robbery. Tina's ex-boyfriend shot Mr. Kameka twice and stole his government-issued pistol from his waistband. He died on the scene. Tina's ex-boyfriend then made an odd request. He told her to go directly to the police station and report the murder. He then boarded a car and speedily left the scene. The seriousness of what just happened was beginning to sink in. If Tina were to tell the truth, she would have to implicate herself in a murder. After leaving the crime scene, Tina was intercepted by Rohan Townsend. He was standing in the wide doorway of a local wholesale shop, silently watching her as she walked to the police station to lie about the incident. Somehow, he convinced her that he should join her at the police station, offering to help her create a realistic cover-up story for the police. Police later determined that he was a part of the crime from the very beginning. His true goal at the police station was to misdirect investigators with false information and also to make sure she followed through with making the false report. The Jamaican police promptly arrested and charged three men, Tina's ex-boyfriend Masinissa Adams, Rohan Townsend and Kamar Dawkins. The first two men were charged with being the actual shooters. Rohan Townsend, however, was charged because of his attempts to confuse and obstruct investigators with false information. The Gilbert Kamika murder trial triggered a firestorm of debates around the state of the country with regards to the rising murder rate. It also led to forceful debates around the age of consent in Jamaica, as well as the increasing frequency of transactional relationships, particularly between older men and younger women. Um, late secondary school had high non-attendance rates, while 41% of the boys said they were simply not interested. 49% of the girls were due to pregnancy. There is no risk deterrence to a child because a child has never been charged for having sex under the age. It is the adult that the age of consent is directed towards. But the age of consent seeks to reduce the predators yes. who take advantage of their economic um, mm -hmm. 
realities, especially our poverty, yeah. and, and seek to use food and, and, and access and gifts as a method of, 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 of playing on their vulnerability. Mm. Thank yeah. you. After a short trial, Tina's ex-boyfriend, Masinissa, was found guilty by a Jamaican jury and sentenced to death. Dawkins and Townsend were also found guilty, receiving life sentences, with no possibility of parole before periods of 30 and 20 years, respectively. The young girl at the center of the incident, Tina Gay McGowan, became a cooperating witness. She served no prison time for her involvement. All three men eventually appealed their sentences. After a successful appeal, Masinissa Adams had his death sentence set aside. He instead received a life sentence, with no chance of parole before 30 years. Rohan Townsend had his life sentence set aside, receiving a 20-year sentence instead. Kamar Dawkins' appeal was refused. I mean, you can't really fight with the, the, the courts once the court filed an individual guilty. And on appeal, a superior court determined that the sentences that were given, there was some amount of mitigation in terms of the, 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 the length of the incarceration. I mean, a superior, a superior court who have um, judicial precedence, but obviously, whatever they say would, would go. Personally, it's, it's, um, it's no consolation because it's not going to bring the individual back and a person getting freed on, on on parole or being fully freed is not much um to celebrate about really because um that stigma is always going to be there and that person will be forever marked as someone who murdered a scene officer but personally that the the i can't say the superior court heard aired but i'll say that um on a personal note, both men should never see the light of the outside of either the prison, general penitentiary or St. Catherine district prison. But such is the nature of um, human rights, um, the push for human rights. Considering that people have been less mourning and continue to mourn because of the absence of one man.